Thank you, Robert, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, I was delighted to get the invitation from Robert to come here. Uh, delighted and honoured. Um, there can surely be no more appropriate place to give a talk on Oppenheimer to mark uh, the publication of my book than uh, this institution. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm not a physicist, uh, as Robert made clear. I'm, I'm, my background is in philosophy, and I wrote biographies of Wittgenstein and Russell. So maybe I should start by saying, how did I get to write a biography of Oppenheimer? Why, why did it even occur to me to do that? It began about 12 years ago when I was asked by the Observer newspaper to review a collection of his correspondence. And up until that point, I knew about Oppenheimer, only what everybody knows about Oppenheimer, that he directed the Los Alamos Laboratory, that he had his security clearance taken away from him, and that he was director of the Institute of, uh, at Princeton. That's really all I knew. I didn't know that he wrote poetry. I didn't know that he wrote short stories, that he was an expert in French literature, that he was, uh, he, he taught himself Sanskrit, that he was deeply interested in Hinduism, and that he taught himself Sanskrit in order to read the Hindu classics in their original language. Neither did I know about his political activities in any detail in the, in the 1930s or his relations with his friends and students and family members. And all of which I found absolutely fascinating. And I, I said in the review, there is a really interesting biography to be written of Oppenheimer. And uh, after this was published, uh, publishers got in touch with me saying, well, why don't you do it? And um, so I did, and it took me 11 years. Um, it's an incredibly rich uh, 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 and, and, and absorbing and fascinating life. Uh, there wasn't a single day in those 11 years uh, when I lost interest in my subject. Uh, he continues to interest. I continue to find out new things about him. Uh, and he is, I guess, like most complicated, complex people, you never feel as if you've uh, exhausted the subject. Which brings me on to my uh, subtitle, uh, A Life Inside the Center. Uh, why Inside the Center? The phrase conjures up a number of things that come together in the life and personality of, uh, of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Um, the most obvious I, of which, I guess, is that his work as a physicist, uh, much of it was to do with understanding the forces that uh, happen inside the center of an atomic nucleus and that his great uh, uh, importance historically and politically is in uh, uh, directing the laboratory that made use of those forces to construct an explosive uh, of previously unimagined power. So that's one, one reason. The other thing that, another thing that the phrase inside the center conjures up that is to do with Oppenheimer uh, is to do with his background and his sense. He grew up in, I'll, I'll talk more about this in a moment, but he grew up in, in Manhattan. Uh, a member of, of, in some sense, an elite, but also with a conscious awareness that from a Jewish family, he wasn't quite accepted uh, by the uh, establishment of, of, of America. And much of what he did throughout his life, I think, was determined by his desire to get inside the center of, America, uh, of American intellectual and political life. And also, in science, he wanted to be at the center, if not inside the center, of what was happening at all stages in his career. And that too, I think, um, had a great influence on various decisions that he made throughout his life. He chose to do one thing rather than another because it would place him inside the center, so to speak. And then the final uh, thought that the phrase inside the center conjures up relevant to my efforts in writing the biography is that I wanted to, so to speak, get inside Oppenheimer's mind. I wanted to write a biography that tried to draw all, all these things that I found in the correspondence, the interest in literature, the short, short story writing, uh, the political involvement, the challenges to, to, to bring all that together um, and describe, as it were, you know, what was motivating Oppenheimer, the way he saw himself and the world. Right. So in a way, no wonder it took me 11 years. Um, to begin at the beginning, this is Oppenheim. This is uh, the town in Germany. It's, uh, it's in the wine-growing area by, by, by the Rhine. Um, 
1808, when Napoleon decreed that all Jewish families must take a surname, previously to that they hadn't had traditional uh, surnames, it wasn't part of their culture, um, many, many Jewish families took the, the name of their employer. My previous subject, Wittgenstein, came from a Jewish family. His great-grandfather had worked for the princely Wittgenstein family and so adopted the name Wittgenstein. Um, many people, many of the Jews who lived in Oppenheim uh, chose the name Oppenheimer. So the name immediately identifies you as a Jew and as descended from people who lived uh, in Oppenheim uh, as uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer's uh, ancestors did. And you can see from this photograph, it's changed remarkably little. This is 1847. Uh, the present day, still very much recognizably the same place. Why would you move from that lovely place? Well, the, the, the Jewish families, the Jewish uh, culture in, in Germany tried very hard to assimilate into uh, German society um, throughout the late 18th and early 19th century. There was a movement, Haskalah, which uh, is the, the German-Jewish version of the Enlightenment, that try to overcome the barriers that separated them from the rest of German society. So instead of uh, Hebrew being their language of worship, they adopted German. Uh, they didn't have separate education. Uh, they tried all the things that they could to overcome those barriers. And what they found was that they still weren't accepted. There were still laws uh, relating specifically to the Jews in Germany, uh, saying what kind of jobs they could do, saying who they could marry, where they could live, and so on. Thus began a movement away from Germany looking towards the United States as a, as a place where they could be free from uh, the restrictions they were facing in Germany. And this poem by, by Goethe to the United States expresses those hopes. America, thou hast it better than our ancient hemisphere. Thou hast no falling castles nor basaltas here. Thy children they know not their youthful prime to mar vain respection, nor ineffective war. Fortune wait on thy glorious spring, and when in time thy poets sing, may some good genius guard them all from baron, robber, knight, and ghost traditional. So the thought here is that the United States is a, is a sheet of blank paper, as it were, free from all these, you know, the traces of the past, the castles, the robbers, the barons, free from all of the, of the European traditions that are holding them back, a sheet of blank paper on which they could write their own destiny. Those were the great hopes that motivated the movement of many, many German people, German Jewish people from Germany to the United States. That became, to, to historians of, of, to Jewish historians, it's become known as the Second Migration. The uh, first Jewish community in the United States, as a result of the first migration, uh, were mainly Sephardic Jews who had been expelled from Spain and Portugal uh, in the 17th century. Uh, they, came, they came to Manhattan, they came to other parts of the United States. By 1840, there were 15,000 Jews in the States, the vast majority of whom were Sephardic Jews. Then came the second migration on a much larger scale. Uh, families like the Oppenheimers, uh, the Seligmans, the Goldmans, the Sachs, um, and as those names indicate, you know, many of those families, their hopes were realized. They came to Germany, some of them penniless. Within a generation, they were some of the richest men in the United States and certainly didn't feel held back by their Germanness or their Jewishness. Um, and those, the, those, the German Jews by 1880 uh, amounted to 280,000 far, far larger than, and, and the Sephardic Jews were ambivalent about this because now suddenly the, the, the German Jews were the acknowledged leaders of the Jewish community in New York City as well as in, in, in the rest of America. Then came the third migration. This is a different kind of thing. This was Polish and, Rus Rus Polish and Russian Jews not looking for a, a blank sheet of paper, not looking for a fresh start, but literally fleeing, from their, f fleeing for their lives. Um, vast hordes of them, the huddled masses, as it were, uh, between 1880 and 1920. And the numbers there are on a different order entirely, two and a half million. Now, Oppenheimer grew up at a time when the, uh, uh, the Jewish community in the United States, generally, and in New York City particularly, uh, was undergoing a kind of split between uh, the rather impoverished Russian, mostly impoverished Russian and, and Polish Jews, Eastern European Jews, 
the centre of their community was, was the Lower East Side. Uh, Oppenheimer.